weird bathing dolls. All right, Doc, <laughs> do, do we need to start the therapy session a little bit sooner? I thought we were going to do that in the post-production. You know what? When we get to book two, when he, when the readers get to book two of this series, they'll understand. They will. So his books drove you crazy. I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but we'll just move on. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, <laughs> it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, we are going to let our returning friend of the show, Mr. Robert Ross himself, introduce himself in case you didn't listen to that episode low those many months ago. So Robert, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello. Yes, I'm Robert Ross, and I am a sci-fi and fantasy author, uh, soon to add a genre of paranormal romance to uh, to my other books. I know could be a huge mistake, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, been writing for probably about uh, ten years. Have about eleven books in market, um, and uh, yeah, that's me. And uh, audiobook, ebook, and print. All right. And the next part of that introduction, dear listener, is uh, how we first found them. So uh, I actually was introduced to Robert through Seska, but he's a pretty friendly dude. So so I didn't kill him, um, you know, like you do to nice people. You just don't kill them. Got to have standards, yeah. right, Rob? I only kill people I don't like. Absolutely. See? Now, Doc, she'll just stab anybody. She's got no standards. Stabbing she does it from the front. are different. Oh, you, you put yeah. the different holes in them so you can recognize them later? Oh, I put the triangle cut in him. Okay, I know that's that's Jim. You can't stitch triangle cuts. That's actually a fallacy, but we could talk about my love of history and the triangle really? bayonet later. Really? I didn't know that. I thought that was a real thing. There's I wrote that it was a real thing, so now I'm a liar too. There's primary accounts where they did stitch it up. The problem is, is it's you know larger wound, more gangrene back in the day, but it was the gangrene that killed you, not the, the triangle bandit, uh, bayonet stab. Got it. Learn something new. I'm still not going to fix that in the book, though. I mean, it's commonly believed if you put it wasn't true, they might not believe you. It's one of those times sometimes you give them the <laughs> lie they want instead of the truth they're not ready for. Uh, right? Like po like poinsettia is pronounced poinsettia. No one believes you. Wait, what? See? Wow. Okay. All right. God, you're so, both such dorks. So when you, when you uh, <laughs> produce this paranormal paranormal romance, do you think we're going to get Doc to go all girly and giddy about it, or is she going to keep her cold, dead heart? I think it might warm her up to room temperature. I think it could. Maybe. What do you think, I Doc? I don't know. Uh, I've read a lot of Laurel K. Hamilton, so it's going to be a lot of work to get me to, to warm my dead heart. Well, I, I think this do with that because it's not that kind of podcast, Doc. I know exactly what Laurel writes. Right? <laughs> oh. I don't know what she writes, but this is this is rated like Family PG, friendly, Doc. PG twelve, I think. Yeah, Laurel. Uh, Seska <laughs> Seska knows that I'm I'm always the fade to back, fade to black as the door closes to the bedroom kind of guy. And I said uh, this she, before, but uh, with my mom as the first line editor, like. Yeah, that, yeah, those scenes just don't happen. She gave me a, a comment back on the first one I ever attempted to put in a book, and it's like, I don't know what you and your wife are doing, but go practice and then rewrite this. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not doing it. So, well, JR, all right. if he ever needs that, I'll write the scene for him. It's less weird people, if his mother reads it when I write it. Yeah, probably true. But she likes you better than she likes me, so I don't know what that says about us. Everybody likes you be better than you. Well, that's probably also true, but that's besides the point. <laughs> I, I, you're just uh, intimidated by my Craig. Work. I think Craig Bertel likes you better. Maybe, but he's a Marine. So, you know, they're not all right in the head. All right. So, that's uh, true. <laughs> Doc, you get to tell us how you met Robert. Was it at uh, a bar? No, actually. No bars Wait, were involved. Hold on. Where's my calendar? Let's write that down. <laughs> my, my wife is very pleased that that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> no, you but your wife brings the, the bar to the party, man. He's good. She does. Did you meet the white person at the bar? Is that what happened? Uh, uh, well, okay. she's Scottish, so she lives at a bar. So it's a pub. Get it right, you culturally insensitive buffoon. It's true. It's a pub. Wow. It's a pub. Wow, Jr. You don't correct somebody on their own background. It's his wife's background. It's different. Oh, okay. So and I'm impossible to insult. So. Me too. I, I had That's to remove my like, heart at the NCO Academy. Uh, uh, but no, so I met Robert because of my work with DragonCon. 
And he reached out to me as smart authors do, particularly when they're new to the con and said, Hey, I'm new and I would love to be involved in paneling. And this is what I do. But uh, if you have any suggestions or anything, let me know. And, uh, and I, and he's like, and I have a, I have a copy of a, my book if you'd like. And I went, I don't have time to read. And he goes, but you live in Atlanta and you have traffic because for those who don't live in Atlanta, there is always traffic. And so I'm like, Oh, Okay, I'll try an audiobook because at the time I really didn't listen to audiobooks much. But uh, the two people who probably got me into audiobooks the most are on the, are on this podcast today. So um, I just finished up Terry Mixon's Empire of Bones, and I was like, okay, this is kind of a cool thing, but that's probably just like a one off because you know. <laughs> so uh, that's what really got me hooked was the two combination and audiobooks, and then. Uh, I met Rachel at the Fantasy Gather as she was holding a bottle of Maker's Mark, and she and I started passing it back and forth. So one minute I've got you hooked with Terry Mixon's free. You know, the crack, the crack is always free the first time to get you hooked. And before you know it, you're hiring his daughter to narrate for you. Uh, I yes. I started you down the slippery slope, and I don't even feel sorry. It's about the only thing you started. I don't even know what to say to that. So how about we ask him the religion question and we'll see if he gets to stick around. Okay. So on to religion. Okay. Hellboy, Dune, or Hellraiser? I would say Dune with a caveat. Oh, do I need no a one. caveat or do I not get caveats? You can no, you have a caveat. caveat. All right. So I would say Dune 90% of the time. Hellraiser 5% of the time when I feel like I'm heading to hell and I need a reminder that I don't want to go there. Uh, and then Hellboy when I think, well, maybe it won't be that bad, but then I'm wrong. Fair. But 90% but Dune. I'm a big okay. Dune fan. So I got to ask, though, because I've read the books. Star Wars or Star Trek? Well, first of all, how many Star Wars movies are there? Three. Exactly. <laughs> correct answer. So if the correct if the answer is three, then both. If the answer is more than three, then it's Star Trek by itself. <laughs> I just don't buy um this whole Trek utopian view of humanity. Like oh, just there. Do... It's okay. It's the one time I get to be an optimist. It's like we're gonna just do things because it's right. And I'm like, no, if there's not cold hard cash involved, they're not doing it. Although well you're a Ferengi currency later. Yeah, but Ferengis were supposed to be the bad guys. They're not bad as much as they are just they follow the rules of uh, acquisition. True. So. But it's, just, it's one of those things. I just It was too optimistic. Although, let's be real. All of us would do probably things we wouldn't want to tell anybody else about if we had the holodeck. You know, I think that I have science no fiction, I think science fiction more than any other genre has a duty to be optimistic. I mean, we are, we're just surrounded by so much crap, especially in the last two years, um, that no other genre, I think, has the capability of bridging divides in a way that's not saccharine, saccharine, saccharinely sweet. Um, that's, just, that's just, I think, I just think that sci-fi has that kind of responsibility because no other, no other genre has, it, has the capability, I think, to do it. They're all great genres, but sci-fi is the singular one, I think, that can really show that optimistic future without it being ridiculous. Now, sometimes they go too far, like you say, that utopia view. Um, but, uh, but I think that, that um, especially across the whole Star Trek universe, there's, there's been enough dusting of darkness uh, while still having it overarchingly be, be positive. Anyway, that's, that's my take on it. So the other no. thing I didn't like about Trek was that they were sending people who wouldn't be on away missions on away missions. Let's be real. The captain's job is to be on the, bridge and the first yep. officer would not be going down either they'd be sending some lowly lieutenant who is expendable but that's part of the beautiful naivete of it all no it's because they paid those actors and they didn't want to have a bunch of the characters get invested in so it's easier to limit the scope i get why they did it from a storytelling and filmography point of view but it just in reality it wouldn't work all right so we'll talk real sure. quick trek okay. uniforms did you like the original uniform they showed in the first we're getting ahead of ourselves no, no, no. This is this is cool. We're good. Let's just roll with the nerdery. You're good. Okay. 
So um, for, for Trek, did you do you remember the original episodes where it had the, the blue uniforms? Oh, you mean like from the pilot from from Menagerie? Yeah. yeah. I did not. I did not I like the, the, the. I did not like the LL Bean co collection. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek. No, I was not a fan. Do you got a you got a way in? You got an opinion? Okay. So, which generation of uniforms do you like the best? Um, I like Next Generation the best. Okay, so you do uh, and, and, and Enterprise. I like Enterprise and Next Generation. Oh, I liked I liked Enterprise too. That was a good one. Yeah. In fact, when I created the uniforms for, um, well, let me rephrase that. When Autumn created the uniforms for Paradigm uh, 2045, um, I had her. I told her I wanted it to be a mashup of the Expanse of Battlestar Galactica and of Next Generation. So basically, uh, Space Force. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, and then I saw the Space Force for uniforms, and I was like, "Autumn, did you send that stuff to to you know <laughs> Washington?" Because I I think those uniforms are snazzy. I do too. I like them. They, they are snazzy. I will they, give them that. They let me be a door gunner on the space shuttle, man. I'm all aboard. But Doc's I'd like, "You got to be a door gunner on a space shuttle any day, Jr." She's got a, Doc wouldn't let me have a spacesuit to do it. See, I'd specify I wanted the uh, the appropriate accoutrement. Well, so. then you'd have a lot of weight to lose. <laughs> You wash your pie hole. You're you're weightless in space. All right. Um, so what about Fair you, Doc? Point. Favorite uniform? You may be weightless, but that doesn't mean you're, you're okay. You have to be a certain shape. You shut your pie hole, and we're gonna move on. Do you have a favorite <laughs> uniform, Doc? Oh, I think I like the next generation ones pretty well, um, and I like the ones that they did during the war with the Dominion. Cool. I thought they were a little bit more rugged and durable looking. I like the original pilot one because I just thought it looked somewhat realistic, and I like the Enterprise. I uniform. never really got into Enterprise, though. I mean, it, it was okay, but I think it just wasn't my jam, so I didn't really get into it. Uh, I liked. I do like the pockets, though. Yeah, the funny one was the uh, first couple episodes of Star Trek: uh, The Next Generation when they had the men in miniskirts because they were sort of poking fun at themselves. Yeah, you watch some of the crew in the background there, dudes wearing the miniskirts, because they wanted to prove they weren't sexist by the uniforms they wore in the original series. They quickly they ended that, because then they got mocked for that, too. I'm sorry? They, they I don't remember this. You're going to have to send me some screenshots. Yeah, I want to see screenshots of that. I don't, I don't remember that. I, I oh, remember you, the... Uh... You shouldn't doubt me. You shouldn't doubt me. I'm, I'm a nerd. I got I, oh, I, oh, I doubt you all the time, JR. Our relationship is built on that. Talking about at Far, Far Point Station, right? That that episode. I, I think so. Um, I'm pulling it up, but Doc, let's move on. And all right, it's the Starfleet miniskirt, science fiction and stock exchange. Let me see if I can pull this up. I'm going to show the audience too because they're not going to believe me. That's what they get for doubting me. They should doubt you because I don't. I don't know that I want to see it. Did the guys at least shave their legs? They did not. What? Mm. Well, I mean, I guess if it looked like a kilt, you know, my wife loves men in kilts. Men in kilts are hot. Yeah, that's what she says. That's why she wanders around with an air blower, just hoping. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's a reason I love your wife. <laughs> I, I She's got to... Maker's Mark and an air blower. What, I <laughs> it. what more one hand and one in one hand and the other. Where's the Scotsman? At one point in time, I played in the pipe band and wore a kilt, and it was some of those old ladies got friskies. I okay. All right. Well, yeah. You know, those could be. Something those are not. That is not a. Thing. That is not a skirt. Those are shorts. No, no. It's it's a it's a dress. Skirt. Okay. Whatever. They call it a mini skirt, but it's attached to the blouse. Okay. I do think he shaved his legs though, so I think this is okay. He did shave his legs. Okay. I can't. I couldn't tell, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt then. He's classy like that. Yeah. Good to know he we've got it. standards. Could have waxed. Same Maybe difference. that was just a bridge too far for him. Ah, uh, he was heading to the bridge too far. Bad <laughs> <laughs> uh, joke. Try the veal. We'll be here all night. Oh my god! All right, Doc. Question number <laughs> fantasy religion. <laughs> Dark Tower, Journey to the Center of Earth, the Earth, or Mortal Engines. Journey to the Center of the Earth, the original. Excellent choice. And if that sounds familiar, dear listener, these are the same ones we gave uh, the mean Miss Jennifer Blackstream, where she she would poo pooed all she over was all our. Perfectly dudes. sweet and nice. She just doesn't to like you. It. 
She just doesn't yeah. like you or my choice. She's like, you've got horrible taste, Jr. I give her booze. So that's the that's the secret to her heart is booze. Yeah, I like her. <laughs> All right, Doc. <laughs> so, um, which was your first love, sci-fi or fantasy, Jr. Me? Not Jr. Rob Ross. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let's Hi. see. The uh, my my first love. Uh, is not necessarily my greatest love, but my first love was fantasy because the first, I guess, long novel books I read were Piers Anthony's Zant series. Ooh, Piers Anthony was one of my first ones too. So Spell for Chameleon was, I think, the, one of the first novels uh, and series that I got into. But your um, greatest love then is sci-fi? Um, yeah, I think, I think my greatest sci-fi is... It's really tough because the two of them, they're like two sides of the same coin to me. Um, As they are. But I, but I, I, I really loved Robert Heinlein's almost everything he's written, and I love Terry Brooks's uh, the Shinar the, the Shinar trilogy. For me, oh, I, I, it, really, yes. it was like like Star Wars. I think it needed to stop at three for me, uh, and I love Dune, which is kind of sci-fi. So you know, more than kind of, it's sci-fi. So um, so they they kind of blend together. But 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 it was after um uh the xanth series uh and actually it was um piers anthony that got me into sci-fi although he only he only wrote as far as i know one maybe one and a half series the um the uh, phase adept series is kind of half sci-fi half magic because the worlds were kind of uh, flip flip one side was magic one side was science no wonder and you then, star wars yes um and um and then spy of a space tyrant which no one ever talks about um it's a good and one. uh and um, that was the first book uh, I read as a young, like a preteen or teen, that um, where they were there was nudity referenced, and I was very excited about that. So, <laughs> so that that sticks in my head permanently, um, and that's how I got into. I was like, well, if there's nudity in sci-fi, I should read more of this. I hope your mom's not listening. Um, she she probably isn't. I think it's a good safe bet. She she's. Still trying to figure out how to make her iPhone turn on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what was your first memory of engaging in, in sci-fi and fantasy? You mentioned the books you read, but was did before you found the books? Did you find it on games or television shows or anything else? Um, yeah. So um, I was oh, in, Commodore sixty four. Yeah, uh, I was actually part of a a program, and this is going to sound egotistical. So let me let me frame it. Uh, it was a gifted program in school, but I was also in the very, very rural parts of uh, southern Louisiana. So I'm not sure that the the bar for gifted was particularly high. So um, you are already a step above by not being your parents not being related. So could be right. So so it was just there weren't a lot of people. It was more, more like that. So so it was, they were perfectly nice and smart people. So there's this program called Keep. <laughs> so diplomatic. Keeping education enjoyable and productive, and so this is like forty years ago, right? So I still I still remember it because, in, as part of keeping enjoy uh, education enjoyable and productive, keep K E E P, uh, I went in. I was like, I don't want to be part of these geeky, stupid, gifted programs. And then I was like, you don't have any homework, and you get to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, sign me up. Where was that when I so, was a kid? So um, it was Robert broke it. Was, it. I broke it. Yeah. <laughs> It was um, S1, first series, Gary Gygax, Dungeons and Dragons, and we played Tomb of Horrors, oh. which if you've ever listened to or read um, Ready Player One, it, 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 it's a significant part of that, of that uh, story. That's one of the keys in Ready Player One. And in my upcoming Paranormal Romance, the, um, the little team of group of people that are in that book they play Tomb of Horrors uh, as well. So uh, it's a classic uh, uh, adventure module that Gary Gygax wrote himself. And it was my first entree to sci-fi and fantasy. It was well, really fantasy because it's Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. So what is it that you love about speculative fiction as a genre? The thing you hate, I think, uh, which is that it's optimistic. I mean, at, at its best, I think that it, it shows it that, um, what's that? I think it needs to be optimistic in a way. 
Well, we have so much pessimism around us. So why write more pessimism? And I've had people, you know, write to me. Um, you, you get reviews. Well, there's also, you know, the end of the tunnel. Uh, uh, and, and since we can't see the future, sci-fi gives us that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and and I think sci-fi is where you're able to introduce a bunch of people or characters, rather, uh, people in the broadest sense, with various immutable traits, and they have to accomplish an objective regardless of those immutable traits. Uh, or they're going to fail because the because the objectives are complex, right? So, you know, uh, you've got lizard people and you've got cat people and you've got you know blobs of people and you've got the, you've got all these different folks with these immutable traits, uh, and you're able to overcome that to achieve a certain objective. Uh, and here we are on our little sphere, just waiting for some um, extinction event to smash into us. Uh, and our our differences are. Our, our gender and race based. And I'm like, really, we can't get past that. And there's like a, a guy with horns and fangs that you're able to, to, to deal with in, in, in our speculative fiction. So I think that we could learn a lot from the, the future that we, we create in fiction. Um, because I think that for the most part, even in, even in the apocalyptic fiction, there's um, in order to fight against the apocalyptic force, the, the remaining folks are, are all you know um, joining together? At least I haven't read anything where the aliens attack and every and, and only the the uh, you know everybody forms together to form a neo-Nazi group and we're gonna we're gonna fight back those aliens as as Nazis. You know, it's it's more like we all kept, we all put aside our, our associated bullshit um, and uh, realize that there's a lot more that binds us together than separates us. Yeah, I think. So I think uh I have a friend who, and Jay and I have talked about it also, is the foxhole effect. You know, you're in it together, and the only way out really is together. Yeah. To just shove that shit that doesn't really matter to a place where it's stuck, hopefully. Yeah. What do you think, JR? I have seen the worst of humanity, so while I enjoy a hopeful resolution sometimes i think if you can go too saccharine on the hopefulness because you have to factor in human nature and it's i mean at, at our base we're what three meals away from reverting to our more bestial selves so i i, I like hopeful i don't know and, and has this internet involved because if you take away the internet i'm pretty sure my kid goes bestial pretty quick well i mean it's well, the that's a meal with uh with uh, <laughs> that's a meal the internet is a meal with, the internet with, uh, is a meal. With our rapid resupply program that we do, um, you know, everything delivered quickly kind of thing. If that breaks down, grocery stores run out of food in three days. And then they say on the fourth day, people become cannibals. I don't know that I'm that pessimistic, but just saying like, you got to factor in realism. And that's, I don't mind hopeful. I enjoy hopeful, but I want it to be realistic too. Like the idea that suddenly we're going to become like the evil Mr. Rogers or something, as they called it in Demolition Man, I just don't buy it. You know, it's interesting because the, what you're talking about, Jr., is kind of the premise behind my, my paradigm book. Because I, it, it came to me as a um, as a single thought, uh, which was, what would happen if splitting the atom started a doomsday clock, uh, whereby a uh, the others, a, a galactic community, kept an eye out for that kind of thing, um, because they determined it from past experience that any species that splits the atom, but doesn't learn how to travel FTL faster than light within a hundred years, inevitably becomes warlike because during that, that intervening hundred years that they're stuck on their little sphere, there's diminishing resources and, and they become warlike to gather those resources to whatever faction they belong to. And then whenever they do develop FTL, because in, inevitably, as long as they don't destroy themselves, they do, they export that violence into the galaxy. So you have a hundred years in my paradigm world. Uh, and if you don't develop FTL within a hundred years, they just send some pods with, with uh, DNA specific pathogens that wipe out the sentient life and you start over uh, because you, you, you lost, you lost the, the, the chance to, to demonstrate that you weren't a shithead as a species. Um, and that's kind of the, that's kind of the premise behind this, the, the paradigm book. I think we're going to lose. <laughs> yeah, well, it's we still have till 2045. Al yeah. has a theory. 
He's got a working theory for warp drives. So I know. So, so I how, did you the, how did you love it? How did you love it? Yeah, yes. my dog did. Uh, how did yeah. your love of fantasy transition into your writing stories in this space? To write write stories in fantasy? I mean, I'm sci-fi. Sorry. Sci-fi. Sci-fi. Oh, sci-fi. So I think um, I talked about this a little bit before. Is um, I think sci-fi and fantasy are two sides of the same coin. So fantasy is where the author creates a world, um, and the world is governed by magic most often, or has magic as a component. And you have to develop a limiting factor to the magic. Otherwise, it's boring and your characters are OP or a character is OP. Um, whereas sci science fiction, uh, the world's been created for you because there's a, a designer of the, of the world, or at least in, in my faith tradition there is. Um, and, um, and those limiting factors are given to us, regardless of your, your background, the limiting factors exist, it's physics, right? So, so like when I was writing Paradigm, um, I was like, okay, so space is really big. I didn't realize how freaking big space is because I really wanted it to be realistic. So I started with uh, the Kepler telescopes and I looked at the Kepler exoplanets and I figured which planet might, might be housing sentient life within our galaxy. And then I was like, okay, how long will it take for us to get there? And I was like, oh man. So then I went to the to the LQB air drive, which is the, uh, this, the theoretical warp drive, similar to what was created on Star Trek. And I'm like, even those are too, even that's too slow. So then you have to figure out another way to solve for how big space is. And that's kind of the hand, hand wavy. So it's really a, a very kind of a, uh, uh, a very short distance between fantasy and science fiction. So it's a matter of, as an author, do you want to spend your time trying to um, create a world out of whole cloth and that limiting factor um, and uh, being able to play around with, um, with a lot of the characteristics of the world um, and, and, and the characters of the world? Uh, or do you, are you interested in taking the world that you have around us and finding ways around the existing limiting factors um, and spend more time on that kind of uh, character development as it happens within that physical world. Okay, sorry about the confusion. I was trying to be quick. So I used the uh, last interview notes and copied it over. And apparently I forgot to change fantasy to the sci-fi because our last okay. interview was about your sci-fi series. So many authors let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell. So were there any specific formidable moments that shape how you tell stories? Um, I, I, probably almost almost all of them. I mean, I, because I was such a horrible writer uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I mean, all, all my writing was really pretentious and crappy because I filled the gaps that were, were left in my personal experiences. I filled with my expectations of, um, of what life really was and, and really gifted authors, you know, the kind of authors that are the, the writing equivalent of, of, of Mozart and, uh, and Beethoven, those kinds of authors, they, they can do that, right? They can not experience things, but write about things they've never experienced or even read about. Um, I'm not that good. So, um, so I'm a different kind of writer. I, I, my, my writing gets better the more I've experienced and I needed to reach a kind of a tipping point of life before I could actually write those things. Uh, so a lot of the feedback I get about my books is that the characters feel so real and the dialogue feels so genuine. Um, and um, I couldn't write that until I had lived an experience, you know, all those different things. So it's really those, those, um, those, Getting, getting, uh, growing up, you know, in a Marine Corps family, bouncing around the world, um, having, uh, getting married, having kids, having a special needs kid, dealing with that, um, and uh, and going through all those life experiences, kind of all, kind of snap together to form kind of the puzzle pieces that allow me to write uh, in a way that I guess the market has determined is, you know, pretty good. That's an acceptable and well thought out answer. Doc, you pick good guests. Thank you. It's not hard. You you get a you get a pay raise. I'll double your salary. Good job. Woo! Nice. We once again we have proof JR sucks at math. Yeah. I mean, I know exactly how the math works out. That's why I'm doing it. Oh, okay. Two times zero is still zero. I get it. I'm not that dumb. Uh, you sure? 
I wasn't a lieutenant. I was a sergeant. I know how to do a little bit of math. Oh, nice. Okay, sure. All right, you get to ask him your favorite so, questions. Going on into some of the fan experience, which is particularly apropos since we just had more cons, in-person cons than good. Yay cons. for cons. Okay, so have you had any cool fan art or seen a cosplay of your character? Yes. Um, in fact, I've had a flurry of stuff this, this year of um, of fans uh, sending me things and showing me things. And uh, in fact, just today, I can't, I don't know how to make, I don't think I can do what you just did, JR, but um, I had um, I had a, a fan, uh, Garrett uh, Zion, um, in case he's listening to this, shout out to Garrett. He, um, he and some uh, and Kiana uh, McCullough from um, were our patrons of mine, and they were kicking around that um, they loved the um, the insignias from my Paradigm series. So Garrett found a place that made made them. Um, oh, cool! So uh, so what I told him was like, well, cool. You know, have some made if you want to have them made, and and we'll uh, I'll put them on my website, and we'll donate all the money that we make from selling them to charity. So, um, so they're they're going to be sh here within the next couple of days, um, and if you look at the cover of any of the paradigm, or the, I guess the first paradigm looks the easiest one to see it, or the artwork on my website, uh, spartamac.com, uh, you can see the um, the insignia uh, of the um, of the crew of the TSS Blade Runner, which is the name of the ship from the paradigm, um, and it's all uh, established by a, a, a an uber rich a guy named Damien Howard. And so the insignia, which the captain Charlotte never realized until someone pointed out to it, her, because it's a little subtle, is two facing unicorns uh, with a stylized H because Damien Howard's last name is H and he's kind of a narcissist. So he had to get his own letter of his, of his name stuck into the insignias. And the two facing unicorns, um, uh, they're stylized, so you don't immediately see them. The two facing unicorns are from Deckard's Dream from Blade Runner. Uh, because Damien Howard was a huge Blade Runner fan, hence naming Earth's first starship the Blade Runner and having the insignias look like those unicorns. So those uh, those uh, pins are coming out. And, um, and let's see, I, I have a couple of goodies back here. I can show you this. This one, this is uh, from my fantasy series. So that's... Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I had... Uh, Hold on, Somebody send me. Second. I'm going send to me. put you solo layout so people see it better. There we go. So that's Nerisha. She's the the incarnation of order from um from my sci-fi or my fantasy series. So um I, that was a goodie. And oh, what is this? Here's a what? That's uh, Shannon's dagger from. I uh, like it from one of the books and that's actually Damascus steel wrapped in leather. Wow. Super, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I occasionally, it doesn't happen that often, but, um, I get, I get goodies. Um, I think there's, I mean, they're, really they're all, they're all over back here. There's, uh, there's, um, ah, Funkos. Nice. That's uh, a character from the books. And then there's another one that's the character from the book. So, so yeah, um, I, I I love when I get goodies in the mail. I'm very I'm you know I'm easy to please. So I I love I'm like a kid when when these things open up. I uh, I understand. I ordered uh, from one of my books the uh, the helmet that they wore with their uniform, the the bucket. I ordered a uh, one made of those, and somebody's sending me a uh, the rifle from that same series that they they three D printed for me. Nice. So I, I can appreciate it. Now those look like they were professionally made. So have you guys messed with some 3D printing for some of that stuff too? Because that seems to be the way of the future. You pay for the SDL and you can just sell the data. Um, I, I haven't. I, I barely have time to write. I've gotten myself behind the eight ball because um, that that series I told you about, the paranormal romance series, uh, years ago, um, I gave it to my daughter to read. Uh, the outline because it came to me. It, I woke up in the morning with the entire 
book in my head, which never has happened to me before. It never happened since. Um, so I wrote it, I wrote down the outline, handed it to her. She came back to me about two hours later in tears um, and said, you've got to write this. And I was like, well, I don't have time to write it. Like I said, I have commitments to a bunch of different books. Um, and so I normally write one book for each series a year because there's nothing that upset me more as a reader than when an author kind of abandoned his series or let preach it. You want to say that again for the people in the back. What's that? I said you could preach that one. You could say it again for the people in the back. Yeah. We all so, know that. We won't mention names. <clears throat> no, I'm right. not going to not going to mention names. Um, but um, but so I, when I decided that when Sentinels became popular enough that I had to decide that I was going to do a series around it, I said, "Listen, if I do it to myself, I said, self, if you're going to do this, then you need to commit to giving everybody at least one book a year." And and so it's a matter of making that happen. And then when I did Sentinel or Paradigm, I was like, "All right, but." The Sentinels people still get their book a year, and now the Paradigm people get a book a year. They're like, "All right, I can do that." Uh, and they each book, they, books keep getting longer. So, so you know, know now happens. I'm writing four hundred thousand words a year, uh, and then I snuck this Paradigm or this this Paranormal one in, um, and fortunately, it's almost done. Uh, I've got four chapters left, um, and it, I'm, I've got to get it done in the next ten days. So, uh, or I'm late for the other thing because I have to start writing the third paradigm book because that one's due to the publisher in June. No pressure though. So now's no. when I should call you and tell you we're having a raging kegger and you have to be there, right? Yes. Elvis says yes. yes. I think I think better when inebriated. <laughs> you usually Good. I have write. no idea how to plan a kegger. I'm not that cool. I think it, I don't think it's a lot involved. I think it's buying the keg and then telling one person that you have it. And then that person takes care of the rest. Are you and sure next you, thing you know? Pack? Yeah, exactly. What? You said you don't know how to throw a kegger. Are you sure you even really went to college? Did you make that degree up? I have two degrees and I was busy getting a degree. And I didn't say I didn't know how, what to do with them. I just never threw them. Huh. I was president of the honors fraternity. I mean, I was in one of those. What a waste of a collegiate experience. Like, blow up shit, not kegger. I mean, like, I, I was in the honor society too, but I still knew how to throw a kegger. What? All right. I said I was in the honor society for history, and I still knew how to throw a kegger. That's because it's history. Nobody cares. You're not the expected to be care. The dead people care. They do. So rude, Doc. All right, let's move this along. I, I don't know if we can tolerate much more of your rudeness. Ask the next fandom question. Okay, has this. anyone asked for your autograph out in public away from a regular book signing event? Um, yes and no. So, so yes, they have, but it's usually because someone is uh, we're talking or something, and they go, "So, what do you what do you do?" And I go. Uh, I'm an author. And they go, really? What have you written? And then I tell them and, and they go, oh, wow, I want to, you know, will you sign one for me? And then they ask me if I, if I'll sign a book for them. Um, occasionally, very rarely, uh, I'll see someone in the wild with my, with my books. It's happened like maybe half a dozen times in 10 years. Um, one time was on a plane. They were reading it on a, um, on a Kindle. Um, and uh, I was, I was poking at the guy. I was like, is that any good? Um, and and uh, he's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty good. It's like, I'm like, it doesn't look very good. It looks kind of, and so um, he was defend. I, 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 he spent like 10 minutes defending why one of my Sentinels books was pretty good. Um, and then, and then he goes, he goes, so you're going to try it. And I go, I'm pretty familiar with it actually. <laughs> Did you give so, him like an audiobook code or something after harassing uh, your fan? I, I was just teasing him and he, and he thought it was hysterical um, because the alternative is to go, Hey, you're, you know, he's to ignore him, which is kind of, I mean, it, it, for me, it, for, uh, you know, I, I suppose if I was, you know, if I was JK Rowling and I was sitting next to somebody, they didn't recognize me. They were reading my book. I wouldn't introduce myself because she's probably just tired of anybody talking to her, but um, it, it would be false modesty for me to not to really, not to think that sit next to somebody reading my book and go, this is cool. So I could either go, hey, that's my book, you know, be interested in me, 
or you know, we we just, I just played around with it, um, and so he he appreciated that. So um, I offered to sign the front of his Kindle. He didn't take me up on it. There used to I actually be a knew somebody who did that. She had um, she has never gotten rid of an ebook reader because she always has authors sign the ebook readers. That the back had. of it, I'm assuming, yeah. at least, not the screen. I mean, we yeah, that's why I started getting a book podcast book though. What? I finally started. We don't judge here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. You can sign okay, now want. shut up so Robert can answer. I said, that's why I started getting getting book plates. So I carry book plates around now in case people want signatures, but they don't want me signing their their phone or their their um, their iPads or something. So it's only taken me like seven years uh, to get that through my my blockhead that that would be a good idea. So I so I carry around some some uh, some book I plates love that book I can just sign. Yeah, they're great. No, they are great. Um, they're really making a comeback. I know. I knew. I've known a couple other authors who've done them now, and because um, particularly during COVID, it was nice because like you could send them out. Yeah. And um, and shipping but, is ridiculous. It's, it costs yeah. so much to ship money, and, unless you send it media mail, which I send a lot of stuff media mail, and then and then you know someone's like, when do I get it? I'm like, I don't know, two months, three, six months. It's the post office. Who knows? Yeah, but then the other thing also is that's nice is uh, the first time I ever saw book plates were what, when it was Anne McCaffrey because she would sign so many in a day because she had arthritis in her hands. So. Right. Um, but having said that, have you? What would be your funniest interaction with a fan? Let's see. Doesn't count my stealing your maker's mark. No. I took that from Rachel. Uh, I think you know. I think I think you know that one, and I think about about the funniest one. Yeah, I think it's probably the one that happened at at uh, at uh, Mysticon, which you're familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I had just done a panel, and um, and we were talking about um, characters and and the different types of love, eros and filial and agape, and um, I talked about how. You know, the, all three of them are in my books, uh, but that I, I generally, in terms of eros, I I only take it to the threshold of the bedroom door, and then I close the door and let let the audience figure out whatever happened in their head, right? Because I don't want to ever write something that my daughter can't read. Um, so uh, after the panel, this woman came up to me, and she decided to tell me in fairly great detail uh, what happened with, between Kellen and Shannon, the uh, two main characters of you, my Sentinel you series. You know that Autumn's gotten old enough to read those other scenes, right? Yeah, Doug I know, but-, but... Written by her <laughs> That's the look of the dad going, shut up. I forgot yeah. to lend her my corset this year. It's 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 different, right? So, so and I, and, and she said this too, she's like, listen, I can watch Game of Thrones, but I'm not watching it with you. <laughs> <laughs> and now that she knows how it ends, she's not watching it at all. But but um, the uh, yeah, so there's a big difference between uh, whether your your young adult daughter can experience something and whether she can experience it with her father or whether her father can experience it around her. I, no, I was no. just joking. <laughs> So anyway, that was that's probably the biggest one because I'm sitting there trying to just keep a straight face as this woman, um, who by all accounts was very delightful. She was really nice and sweet, and she was completely uninhibited in her description. But I I was not. <laughs> I was very embarrassed. Uh, I also was thinking I've never tried that before, and um, thought you know. <laughs> Let me give my wife a call and bounce this off her. So do you think that she was inebriated? Because I know a lot of doc stories start with booze. No, she was she, she was stone cold sober. She was stone cold sober and and was living a very rich fantasy life with um between the characters count like uh, Kellen Thorne and Shannon McLeod's characters. She was um I was like, you should write that down. Um use different names, please. Because I'm pretty sure that's how Fifty Shades of Grey came about, didn't it? Some some fanfic for for uh, for Twilight I have that no turned idea. into actually yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. So I don't want that. I don't, I don't need 50 shades of Sentinels going on. I don't need that. No, no. <laughs> sure, because because we could meet some people. We could we could make some introductions. I got Doc, some panels for that. Doc actually knows uh, Louise Handy, uh, who writes uh, Naughty mm -hmm. Entertainment. No, no, they can they can do that with Terry stuff, not mine. <laughs> so so the joke with that is when we the first, the one time we she was close enough that we, that I drove down to meet her when I happened to be in North Carolina for something else. Uh, was it Fantasy? Was that the con? And uh, she told people as a joke that we were going to write um, the the bedroom stuff because we want to keep this family friendly. And she was going to use Louise Handy. And they thought she was serious. So I was fielding for like a week and a half about like, was I really going to do it? Did I need their connection to cover artists? And I'm like, how many of my author friends are writing smut in the evening for, for Moonlighting? Because they were all like sending me recommendations for covers oh, and editors. I, I had so many people because I wrote the one short story and they were like, are you going to write? And I'm like, eh. and I'm like, Jerry writes. That's his gig. And they're, I'm like, they're like, but you did something with him. I'm like, okay. Anyway, so I thought this would be funny. I'm like, I'll just write the dirty scenes. You can do all the heavy work. Well, for those kind of stories, uh, that, that's pretty much all it is. So we'll move right <laughs> along. And we're going to talk about everything Robert Ross has written. I didn't so, think they were taking me seriously. They always do, and then I get calls, like that time with you and Mel, but it's a family-friendly show, and we're going to move on. So, yeah. Ross, uh, Robert. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so she made the joke. You've heard the jokes between her and Mel. People thought it was real, and they reached out and asked if they needed to send congratulations or not for the nuptials. Oh, um, Seska and Mel were getting hitched? Apparently. Maybe. All right. Well, there you go. You get, you know. I'll send you some makers, Mel, Mark, as well. Mel smokes, smokes a mean butt. So, I mean, that's uh, that's that's a plus for you. I, <laughs> There's a double meaning in that. I, I, I caught the double meaning. Ross, how about you tell us everything you've written? Before you get JR in trouble. Too late. <laughs> everything I've written? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's a lot. I've, um, so, I've written... Um, Seven Sentinels of Creation books. Six are published. The seventh one comes out in January or February. Um, uh, two Paradigm 2045 books. Those are both out. The third one comes out in Ju uh, August or September. Um, uh, an anthology uh, in Storm it's called Storming Area 51, which came out a couple of years ago. And I republished the novella from that, Isabella's Campaign, um, and did an audio book of that as well. Um, and then the book that's coming out, I haven't decided when, what, I really don't know when it's going to be released, but the, um, the Paranormal Romance uh, is One Heart That Beats for Two. And that uh, is draft complete in the next two weeks. Doc? If they ever pay to see what we write on the side comments, we're in trouble. <laughs> all right. So while all of those facts sound fascinating, today we're going to talk about your Paradigm 2045 series. Paradigm Shift is how I, I keep referring to it in my head. Uh, specifically book one, which is Trinity's Child. So where did you get the premise for this uniform? How'd you, uniform? Universe. How did you come up with it? Was it psychedelics, Ouija board, overindulging in her radical unsweetened iced tea? Well, one in three... Uh, I'm a Catholic, so if we touch Ouija boards, we catch on fire. So we're not, uh, there won't be that end of that. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's uh, I, I, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast that that, that one just came to me. It was actually in my kitchen, uh, and that sentence came into my head, which was, "What if splitting the atom started a doomsday clock?" Okay, and so that's, that was it. That's where it started. Yep. I thought maybe you were toying with it before that, which is how you got that idea. But that, that works. No, nope. I mean, I literally was making a sandwich and uh, taking a break from writing my Sentinels book and um, you know, whatever one I was writing. I think it was number four, uh, number three or number four. And that popped into my head. I was like, hmm, that's an interesting idea. Uh, and then I, I keep notes all over the place. My, 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 uh, my iPhone and Mac are just filled with notes. So... Um, Rachel just has learned to deal with it. She'll be talking to me and then she'll, she'll be like, I don't respond. And she sees me hunched over tapping and it used to piss her off, but she's just deals with it now. Cause she knows 
She's like, you're taking notes, aren't you? I'm like, yep. Just laughing all the way to the bank. All right. So this is the part <laughs> Not of the, quite. This is the part of the intro, uh, introduction uh, uh, where you tell us about this book cover. So you mentioned your daughter did it. I thought she was No, no, no. She did the uniforms. She did the uniforms. So she is not the, the graphic designer for the cover? No, no, no. Uh, the, the, the artist is George Petsoris. Uh, he is my uh, artist and friend. I've worked with him since the very beginning. Um, and uh, he is in, he's a, he's a Greece, which is a good place for a Greek man to live. Um, and uh, so that's him. Yeah, he did that cover. Um, and um, that's one of, one of my favorite ones. It's just a lot packed into that cover. Um, you know, and I put Easter eggs in all my covers. Um, so when you, so if some people download the artwork from my website, you can zoom in on them. Uh, like for example, in my Sentinels books, uh, Shannon, Kellen and Shannon are in every cover except one. And in that one, Kellen, uh, the male character has a, an iPhone sticking out of his pocket with a text message. And if you zoom in on it, it says, Kellen, why am I not on this cover? Uh, from, from Shannon. So in this one, um, if you zoom in on Charlotte, she's the Kenyan woman in the front. If you zoom in on her eyes, and then if you zoom out and zoom in on um, one of the other characters, the character in the top left, and zoom in on his eyes. Oh. They are identical down to the pixel or the, uh, the color code. Uh, and there's a reason for that that gets explored in the book as to why those two people who would seemingly be of completely divergent DNA would have exactly the same eye color. So you said number three, you couldn't do either because you're not a heretic and you don't drink unsweet iced tea. I approve of that. No, no, number two, number two, I can't do number two, the Ouija board. Can't touch Ouija boards. Catch on fire. Oh, and psychedelics. Okay. So you do and drink unsweet iced tea. Where's the mute button and the block button doc. Help me out here. They are. Yeah. You're delusional. It's okay. Sorry. All okay. Right. I thought you were going to ask, so I was going to, you know, not leave us hanging. But I mean, if you're ready, no, you're supposed to ask. Do your job, woman. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's your question, but if you want me to do your job for you, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> so moving on, what would your thirty-second elevator pitch for this novel be? Um, let's see. I would say, um, no more sinus medication for me. <laughs> that'd be it. That would be, that would be my pitch. 30 second pitch. Uh, in 1945, we split the atom and got the attention of a galactic community. They gave us a hundred years to demonstrate FTL. Uh, it's now six months before that, um, grace period ends and a, Trillionaire eccentric has assembled a team of people uh, who are humanity's last chance to demonstrate that we are ready to belong to a galactic community. And if we fail, we die. So when do they find out about the galactic community? When, who's the we or they? Humanity collectively, when do they know about the, the doomsday clock and the, all of that? Humanity writ large finds out about it about six months before so shortly after the new year 2045 talk about the main, waking up just in time for your alarm to go off yes well they they're if you you know you think of humanity right we would not as a global entity do very well with that so the, you see the group there on the cover that they they were aware of it longer um, and uh, someone who's not pictured is the is the old guy who first decoded the message, uh, you know, not completely unlike the uh, hitchhiker guide message warning us that we were gonna they were gonna do an interstellar pave highway right through our planet, <laughs> um, and um, and so he knew about it since um, uh, two thousand and four, so he he's been working since two thousand and four. To uh, to avoid this galactic or this uh, this extinction of it, and part of that included a genetics program, which literally created the people you see on the cover. Um, 
so uh so so that guy damian howard um uh experimented with some questionable science and ethics in order to save humanity which is one of the one of the themes that i I like to explore uh because because no one is no one is a villain in their own story um they're always i mean if they are it's really bad writing so so villains always think that they're doing things for the right reason and it's because they have skewed skewed uh morals and points of view. Now, Damien's not like that. He's not. He's not an evil character or, or doing things uh, broadly speaking evil. But he certainly um, does things that uh, are ethically questionable, um, and that's one of the one of the thematics in the story that get explored gets explored. Okay, Doc, you ready to ask a question? Or you want me to do your job for you some more? Oh, you wish you could do my job. So what is it that makes the series special and really stand out? I think, um, so I wrote this in 2019 and it was published in 2020. So I, I, and I bring that up specifically because I've gotten a lot of feedback and a tremendous amount of feedback, both good and, and bad. Um, from people who kn some knew stuff and some were completely ignorant of the history of the book. Uh, so a lot of people thought that I wrote this kind of in response to some of the events of last year, because my characters are, are as you can see from the cover, they're really diverse, right? So there's uh, the, the main character is a woman from Kenya. Um, her first officer is a CCP person. Um, the, the the book is not american centric um there's a, a woman from norway there's a guy from ireland there's another woman uh, a, uh an officer senior in charge of all of the engineering from india um and so i've gotten i've, I've gotten feedback of like you know well you shouldn't write about uh, a black woman you're not a black woman and i'm like okay well if we only write about things that we are then we're not going to be writing about it very much um, and I even got, you know, I had someone say, well, you, you should change her, make her something else. And I put, I wrote about this in my author's note. And I said, you know, I could, I could no more change the melanin in Charlotte's skin than, than I could change her faith tradition. She's got both. They're, they're immutable. They're part of her. They're not the totality of her, but they're part of who she is. Um, and these characters come to me with certain immutable traits and that's just who they are. Um, so, um, you know, I think that 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 that's kind of been been, you know, one of the one of the grounding points of, of this series. And the thing that I'm, I'm most proud about is that uh, without setting out to make kind of a societal statement, because, again, I wrote this in 2019, uh, people are finding in it certain truths that, that, that it seems like we knew for a while and have lost of, of late is that um, it, if you if you just spend a little time trying to understand where other people come from, uh, it's a lot harder to be an asshole to them. So, you know, for example, Charlotte, um, the captain there is, um, is a devout Catholic um, and her first officer is an atheist. Um, and he makes mention several times that she has to go commune with her invisible sky man. Um, and she doesn't flip out and she doesn't try to convert him she doesn't get, get pissed off. She just tells him after a couple of times he said it that he needs new material and maybe he should go with the the the, uh, the spaghetti monster. Um, and and that's kind of how we used to be. Is that you know it's not I don't need to change you, whoever the you are in that scenario. Um, if I'm comfortable with who I am and uh, and I can respect our the differences. And we have a job to do. And as long as we respect each other and where we're coming from, uh, and we don't, we're not mean or rude or dismissive. And even Chow, that's the that's the Asian um, uh, uh, atheist. He's he starts off dismissive, but if you meet dismissiveness with that same energy, then you end up not being able to see past it and develop the relationship. So part of Charlotte's gift is is she's a leader. That's her that's her true gift is being able to give other people what they need when they need it so they can be their best self. That's her gift. Um, and so she just doesn't feel the need to meet his, his dismissiveness with similar dismissiveness. 
And, um, and it's one of the best things I think about that series is how their relationship slowly evolves across the three books. Um, and I think there's going to be some really interesting scenes in the third one. I just took some notes on it today, uh, between, um, between Chow and Charlotte, um, in relation to his daughter in the third book. Um, so that was a long winded answer for, for your question. So sorry about that. That is a okay. So, um, what trips do you think Trinity's children really hits the best? Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, I had someone re re do a review and, and I love, I loved it because it was insightful. Um, and I even like bad reviews when they're insightful. So I, I just love really insightful reviews. And this, this uh, person wrote that uh, paradigm relies on some tropes and crushes others. And, um, and I thought to think about that for a while. And I think they're spot on. Um, and I think some tropes are, are tropes and are good tropes, you know, like, um, you know, the, the, the trope of uh, e pluribus unum, right? Out of the many one. So, so this book, um, I had someone else tell me it was like a space faring Italian job. I'd never heard that before. So if you're familiar with the movie, The Italian Job um, uh, and the remake, also called The Italian Job, uh, both movies, fantastic, highly recommend them. But it's about a group getting together to, to, to pull off a caper, right? Now these, these guys aren't getting together to pull off a caper, but um, in the first book, you, you, that, that, that crew slowly forms. So you have to get to know each one of them separately. And then they form, instead of being eight different people um, that are all pursuing eight different objectives, out of those many, one group forms, which is the crew of the Blade Runner. And that's kind of the climax of the story, out of the many, one. And that's the ultimate challenge that Charlotte had. How do I make one out of many? Um, so that's kind of the trope that I rely on. Um, and then I guess a number of tropes, I won't go into all of them, but a number of tropes that get kind of kind of crushed is that, that trope where uh, especially female characters are used as plot devices where they're either there to be saved or there to be uh, desired uh, or, and it's these mutually exclusive things. So uh, the, 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 the blonde gal in the, in the lower left, lower right as you're facing it. Um, uh, I start off with introducing that trope uh, in that the, the, the stronger, the, the empirically stronger, the obviously stronger character, uh, the one in the center, Misha, makes fun of her and doesn't like her at all, uh, calls her Barbie, um, and basically says, you've always had everything given to you because you're because men look at you and they'll do whatever you want. Uh, and you've never had to develop any strength because, uh, because you haven't had to suffer the way I suffered. So she's looking at the exterior and she's making these judgments. Um, and then as the story progresses, you see these incredible depth uh, of both pain and tragedy and triumph in this woman's life, in, in Linnea's life. Um, and, um, and I think it's that, it's that trope of, uh, as I mentioned, kind of the, the women as, as, as I described it, and also that exterior appearances dictate the interior life, uh, that, that it, it was just kind of smashed to pieces. Um, and those two characters end up having a really incredibly close relationship um, because uh, Misha isn't as hard as her exterior would lend you to think. And Linnea is not as soft or as a damsel in distressy uh, as one might think as well, given her background. Uh, and they come to respect each other greatly because of that diversity. Okay. That's a good answer. <laughs> so I've actually read this, but so we can talk some about the trope, the subgenres. This one really kind of fits, you know, the early explorer. I always feel like the first book particularly has like that Ocean Eleven vibe. I don't watch a lot of heist movies, but I definitely got that vibe. Um, but what other... Uh, early so early space exploration, ur urban sci-fi. What other subgenres you think this would fit with? So I I was pretty ignorant about subgenres. In fact, the first time my publisher was like, "Well, you know, we're going to put this in space opera, 
when I uh, three years ago when I when I gave him the outline, and I was like, really, there's there's no singing at all, um, and um, because I, I had never I, I didn't even know that that was a thing. I mean, I think I'd heard it before, but I never really made the connection like Star Wars and space opera, and I still don't know why. I, I know I understand the definition fully now, but I still don't know where it what the genesis of tying you know opera to it. But I guess it's just an expansive story, but. But in any event, so space opera um, uh, is one is one subgenre. Um, first contact is another one that it's put into often, and AI. So one of the main characters really develops in the, in the series is 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 an artificially intelligent character, um, and the demon uh, starts off as just a, a, a non sentient scripting agent, a really complex one. Um, and uh, develops into something more throughout the three books. Um, and with the demon character, I really got to have a lot of fun with exploring what it means to to truly be sentient. What's the different? What is self awareness? What is self determination? Can you have self awareness without self determination? Of course you can. That's called slavery, right? So if you're self aware but not self determinative, then you're a slave. What is the meaning of that? So I had a lot of fun with Charlotte. Uh, having that discussion with the demon, D-A-E-M-O-N, which again is the Unix uh, uh, scripting agent. Um, and um, and so um, surprisingly, the demon has become a fan favorite in terms of characters. They just love his, its evolution, uh, continuing evolution from uh, basically an amoral- Murder uh, bot. Yeah an amoral murder bot that if you don't tell operational constraints, like I need a plane right now. Okay, I'm gonna take that jumbo jet. I'm going to uh, express all the air so I can get rid of these annoying organics that are inside it and I'll bring it to you. It's all empty now um, uh, to something that becomes more. <laughs> yes, I like murder bot. He's a little funny. He is a little funny, and Nick does a great job because we, when we do voices, I said uh, I want you to I want you to give him initially his voice changes the demon's voice changes over time, but when you first meet the demon, I was like get get me as close to Hal Nine Thousand as you can. Okay, so speaking of the crew, this is where we're going to start transitioning into the novel itself. Why did you go with uh, Blade Runner for the title? I mean, I we, you've explained how you justify it in the universe, but. But you, as the creator, why did you pick Blade Runner as the first FTL show? Um, I I just love the movie. I think that that uh, I, I've I've bought that movie at least a dozen times, which is annoying. I bought it on videotape at least three times because you know they keep releasing new versions. I bought it on laser discs. If everybody remembers what a laser disc is, I remember. Um, and um, and it's a it's just a it's just a fabulous story. Um, at least to, for me, um, and um, it's kind of uh, it informs a lot, a lot of a lot of my writing, really, because when I think of the the different versions of it, um, the theatrical version assumed people are stupid, right? So there's a lot of voiceover, like this, they, this these are pictures, these pictures are on a piano because they remind you of memories, and memories are things that robots don't have. I'm like, okay. I get that. You could have just showed me the pictures. Uh, I'm not stupid. Um, and the director intended for the audience to not have that voiceover, right? And then the ending is ambiguous. This elevator closes after um, uh, Edward James almost goes, you know, she's not going to live. But then again, who does? Which is a great line. Elevator door slams fade to black. We don't know what happens. Theatrical version, they ride off in a sky car into the distance to live happily ever after. So when I'm writing, I look at it and I go, all right, so I don't want to do, um, I don't want to do Game of Thrones. Um, I think there's enough darkness in the world. It's, it's, it's a fantastic book, those that are written. Uh, uh, but um, I'm not going to plunge the dagger into Danny's heart in the last of the book, right? I'm not going to do that. So, so spoiler all my books end in triumph. There, there's tragedy along the way. All true stories have death in them, and mine are no exception. All good stories, I think, have death in them and tragedy and sacrifice and suffering, because life is all those things. But ultimately, 
personally, my faith tradition is that life ends in, tri in triumph. So my books end in triumph. So that's kind of the thing that I took from from um, from Blade Runner, all those things. Uh, and, and life can end in triumph without you having to make it uh, handhold the, the, the audience through it. They can fill in some of those things themselves. Um, so all those reasons are the reasons why I wanted to give homage to a to a movie that I thought was um, was great, um, and um, and that's where it is. And and you can even see it on Karishma. She's the uh, chief engineer. She's in the lower left of that image. If you look really carefully in that image, she's wearing a Blade Runner T-shirt from the launch of the movie in 1989. Interesting. Okay. Uh, if I was going to name it, I'd probably go with something like crazy as a loon. Call it the loon because you'd have to be crazy to be the first one to give it a shot. Something along those lines. Um, I was. I almost called it the gay deceiver. Out of, from, but but that would have been too too close to home because that's what Heinlein named his ship. Not to mention the fact that probably. Twitter would have can't tried to cancel me because they wouldn't have bothered realizing that the gay deceiver was a ship that Robert Heinlein wrote about and has nothing to do with being gay. Yeah. Before the word meant that. Yeah. All right. So now let's move on to the story itself. What can you tell us about your main character? Is there one singular main character or a cast of them? No, it's an ensemble. Um, Charlotte is a, a, a brilliant, um, 30, mid thirties, early thirties, uh, woman from Kenya. Um, uh, Linnea is a 19 year old um, from from Norway. Pretty much everybody else is in their their early early 20s, early mid 20s. And they're from Ireland, Russia, um, um, and um, India, and uh, the United States. Um, and they they um, they all kind of work together. Um, they slowly, they slowly join. They you start off with with just Misha. She's the one that's been with da, uh, Damian Howard the longest. He's 137. Uh, he's not pictured on the cover, but uh, he's the one that first discovered the the message about from about the alien destruction. Jr. What about secondary characters? With as large of an ensemble as you had, did you have any that really struck, or did you just focus on the main set? Um, you know, it's interesting because I got a I got a review uh, recently where the person wrote that um, that they really enjoyed how each character got their screen time to the point where, as a reader, they felt invested in all of them. Um, there, there's some ancillary, or I guess I would say tertiary characters, to be sure. It's probably another 30 characters in the book. Um, and, th and those are the ones that kind of make the world seem real because you're interacting with them. Um, although the, the, um, the, the Secretary Gen General of the UN is, is a, a tertiary character, to be sure, but... Um, I asked Nick to do his voice like um, the um, the talent agent or the, the for the for the um, what is it called? The, um, oh gosh, it's it's the Australian show. It was uh, Flight of the Concords. So um, the Kiwis, rather. So he does a Kiwi accent for this guy and just nails it. So whenever I hear the Secretary General talk, he, it's it's from Flight of the Concords, um, and that just makes me laugh every time I hear it because he does such a great job. Um, but um, but really, I, it's it's uh, I tried to and and I use software to do it. Uh, I try to make sure that these characters are um, present enough so that the audience really cares about them, because good things and bad things happen to them. And embarrassing thing happen, ha happens to them. And if you're not invested in them, then you don't care, right? You're not going to cry. You're not going to laugh. You're not going to go, oh my gosh, and worry um, if you don't care. So you've got to really dig deep into who they are. Uh, and so um, that's why these books are so long. 
uh, because it, it takes a while for you to, do, to give them that screen time. How long is too long or so long? Or what's, what's, what are we talking about for length? Um, the first paradigm book was 170,000 words, um, which at the time was my lot, my largest book. Um, uh, by contrast, the Sentinels books are around 120. Um, and the Humanities Children, the second paradigm book, is the largest book I've ever written. And I hope I don't write one this long again. Uh, and that was over 200,000 words. It's 20, almost 24 hours of, of audio. Um, yeah, and it's just dumb. You know, from a, from an author financial standpoint, it's just dumb because you, you can't make you can't make money on a book that big. I can't. I mean, you're J. R. 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 J. K. Rowling can make money on, on that kind of book. Stephen King can make money on that kind of on that size of a book. But um, I'm. You know, they have tiers of authors. You know, I'm tier two, um, and so tier a tier two author, re, you know, writing a two hundred thousand word book is just financially dumb. But I'm dumb, and the story needed to be that long, and um, that's how come it was that long. Um, I had the I had a publisher suggest that I split it into two, and I had an author friend of mine who did that with his with a with a too long book, and and I wasn't going to do it. Um, and it's a good thing because he got raked over the coals because your, your audience, your fans know because you know two hundred thousand words isn't long enough, right? So if I took a two hundred thousand book and I split it into two, then I had I would have to add thirty thousand words to each half, and then you're you're fluffing it up, and people can tell that you're fluffing it up. And then they think you're doing a cash grab because you're trying to sell them the one book twice. And I'm just not into it. So, um, you know, fortunately, I'm in a position where I get to make those decisions um, and within reason. Uh, and um, I, my, on the audio side, my publisher is super supportive. In fact, they were the ones when I first uh, signed with them that they were looking at my Sentinels book and they said, you need, they need to be longer because they don't want books that are only like 100,000, 120,000 words. And so when I turned in Humanity's Promise, um, the uh, the gal that I work with at, at, at Podium was like, my God, this is big. And I was like, you said make it bigger. This is your fault. <laughs> so is that your publisher for all of it or just the audio books? Um, that's for the, for the audio. Yeah. For the audio. Yeah. I mean, it's not the longest audio book I have. You're good. No, I've seen some that are like 40 hours. It's just insane. Rachel loves the uh, the Outlander books, and those are all like 40 some hours. Oh, Way of King is like 60 something, I think. Yeah, but that's got time uh, travel and it's acceptable because they go back to historic Scotland. That's right. Oh, it's acceptable and, because it's JR's favorite chick book. And and and, Gabal and Gabaldon book, can describe a table for 35,000 words. In my defense, when I read that one, it was shelved at Barnes and Noble in the time travel section, not the romance section. And by the time I realized I'd been duped, I was invested. There's no time True. travel section. It is in the fiction literature section, though. It had so, uh, so JR, when you, when, if, you, if, you, if you read my if you read my paranormal romance book, I'll have it shelved virtually in the paranormal section so you can feel good about yourself. Thank Aww. you. See, he, he actually likes me on like Seska. All right. Yeah. So no, you just need all the help you can get. You watched. All right. So we've talked about the evil aliens or are they? Well, first off, we don't know they're evil. But we talked about the aliens that sent the doomsday device uh, if we didn't reach FTL. And we've clearly got the opportunity for humanity itself to be the bad guy. So does this story have a, an actual direct bad guy or is it just, you know, man versus the universe? Um, that, no, that was another one that I really wanted to spend some time on because I, I wrote about this in one of my author's notes. My, my my books are like ogres and onions. They have layers. So on, on the, at the first layer is that you could just listen to it or read it and have a great time and just unplug your brain and just hopefully have a good time. Because I think that um, I think that in entertainment these days, things have gotten reversed uh, where people think that their job is to deliver a message. And then hopefully people who receive the message are entertained as well. And I think that's bass backwards. My job is to entertain you. You're paying me to, to give you a fun romp in a universe that I create. Uh, if I do a good job at that, then I earn the right to have some messaging in there 
that is there if you choose to look for it. If you don't choose to look for it, my first job was to entertain you and you can stop right there. And then if you find that message and you think about it and you wanna ask me questions, or you wanna ask other fans questions, uh, which happens, then you, you have the opportunity to elevate the conversation. So from my perspective, you think of it as a pyramid, it's entertainment, it's messaging, it's elevation. So back to your question about, about bad guys. So in, in, in Paradigm, what I, it's really easy to look at the folks that tried to kill all of humanity and immediately go, the entire galactic confederation are bad. Then you find a little bit out a bit more and you're like, okay, so there's lots of species as part of this confederation. Um, it was the reptilian species that was really focused around the extinction event. All of these reptilian creatures, their species is called the Dracath. All Dracath are bad. Um, and one of the characters even says that. So Linnea is having a conversation with Misha and, and they're talking about Misha or Linnea, who's a, who's a telepath, so she's she she's more cerebral, and she goes, you know, she's talking about negative emotions, and one of them she's like negative aspects, and she's like anger, prejudice, something else, and Misha's like prejudice isn't always it isn't always bad. And she's like, what are you talking about? Prejudice is always bad. She's like, no, and it just Misha's got this Russian accent now, and um and she's like, well, I'm prejudiced against um against the Jokath. They tried to murder my entire planet. And she's like, you can't judge an entire species like that. And she's like, I can until I see more nice lizards than I see mean ones. Um, and so that's Misha's perspective. So then that opens up the conversation, at least within the book of what do you mean? They're not all bad. So you go from somebody did something bad to us and everybody associated with them is bad. So the Galactic Confederation is bad. Then all the Dracath are bad. And then, well, maybe it's just a few of them. And then how do we discern the good ones from the bad ones? And that's the and nature. Pineapple on their pizza. Yes. But in this case, it is clear that anyone with pineapple on their pizza is the same as a race committing genocide for the whole planet. What? No. I'm sorry. You just can't put. You can't put. You can't do it. Pineapple on pizza is a no. Still stop. I agree with him. I I concur. It's okay. All right, Doc. This is your other favorite question. You got this. I don't need a pep talk. Maybe some caffeine, but not a pep talk. Okay. So, if your characters met you in a back alley, what would they do to you? And who would actually, of this cast, who would you be the most afraid of to meeting you? What would they do to me in a back alley? I know what I wish for that a couple of them would do to me. Although Rachel would be really mad. Oh! Um, yeah, that's not happening. No. I think um, you might hurt you. James would take me out for a pint. Uh, Charlotte would would uh, help me become a better writer and 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 dissuade me from all the negative thoughts that I have about a book that I'm in the middle of writing. Um, can I borrow her? Uh, I could use some no. of that. <laughs> can I borrow her? I could use some of that. <laughs> she's, I, yeah, she's yours, man. Uh, I've, I've given her to the world. All, all you have to do is, is embrace her and she's yours. Um, so I, I, you know, I guess each of the characters would, would do, you know, would, would so do the thing that they're, that they're best the at. the most negative to you? The most negative, um, probably um, probably Chow. Chow would Chow would have very little tolerance for me. He's a he's a very taciturn dude, and I'm the opposite of that. Uh, and I don't take a whole lot too seriously, um, and uh, can t tend to be a, a bit irreverent uh, in my continual exploration of trying to understand where people come from. I'm, I'm the guy that when when the Mormons ring my doorbell during their mission trip that I go, no, I haven't heard that. Why don't you come in? We'll talk about it for two hours. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had one of them come to my door. You missed out, man. It's great conversation. We swap yeah. books. We swap books. I don't believe what's in theirs. They don't believe what's in mine. Eh, it's fine. 
Interesting. Maybe yeah. doctors warned them about me and they just don't come. <laughs> Maybe they just have better taste. So, given, give us a sneak peek on how the sausage was made. Were there any cool ideas that you cut from this book to use somewhere else in the later on in the series? Um, there was this, there was an entire chapter that got cut during alpha. So I, I do, um, I do an alpha, a beta, uh, stages. So I draft, then I do cold reads with a very small group of close friends and family. And then, um, I revise based on the cold reads and then, uh, I, I, I print beta copies, send them out to five people. They give me their beta feedback. I revise again, and then it goes to the publisher. Um, so um, there was a scene or a chapter in um, where Charlotte, uh, Misha, and Linnea are, uh, and and Narath, who's a female Drakaf, female uh, reptilian, were discussing their their past sexual experiences or the lack thereof and I got done reading that and my alpha folks were were appalled um, and they thought it was absolutely horrible uh, second only to a chapter I wrote from Sentinels that dealt with them acting out a scene from Greatest Showman the musical um, which I saved just to show me that sometimes ideas that I think are absolutely genius are not. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that, that discussion between the four female characters about their, their sexual histories um, while still being PG-13 was cringe of the highest order. So it never, never made it. I didn't even save that one. I deleted that one and then purged the delete. It's gone forever. Wow. Yeah, it was bad. It was really bad. So um, you've kind of told us a bunch about the world. Is there anything that we haven't really covered about the world so far? Um, I don't think so, except, you know, how, how the, the, the hand wave you and how you travel. Um, so it's interesting, though. I guess the interesting about the world is that in, in both my sci-fi and my fantasy, there's some folks that are just outstanding at world building and they focus a lot of their energies on the world building. So Brandon Sanderson is, is one of those folks. So he'll spend an inordinate amount of time figuring out what the world looks like. So, you know, in the Radiant series, you know, about how storms work and grass hides during storms, all this kind of stuff. Um, and um, that's not my... That's not my gift. Um, so my worlds exist as a way for the characters to, to, to operate. So, so all my books are really character centric. Uh, mm -hmm. The worlds have to make sense, but um, unlike say a Sanderson or even a Gabaldon, where they're going to spend an inordinate amount of time describing the environment in infinite detail. Um, I describe it enough for the audience to fill in the gaps with whatever they want it to be. Um, and I spend the bulk of my time giving an incredible amount of depth and texture to the people um, in their dialogue. So, so I've, I, I, I've talked to other authors who almost all of their dialogue is, um, is almost third person where they're, where you read about the things they say, like, you know, Joe talked about how he used his head weapon to kill that rat. Um, whereas in my books, it's it's all the characters saying what it is they're doing. Um, and, it, and apparently, for people that are good at environmental writing, that dialogue writing is really hard. Uh, for me, that environmental writing is really boring. So I don't do as much of it. For me, it's kind of boring. I just don't, I'm not interested, so I can't make it interesting for others. Um, but the dialogue, uh, I can, once I get to know the characters, I, I, I can close my eyes and I can put them in the situation and I kind of watch them and write down what they say. 
um, which sounds like I'm insane and I'm not going to argue the point. Um, but, uh, that's kind of the way it works. I literally write down what they say. Okay. Um, you hear voices in your head and you get paid for it. Got it. Yep. So, Paradigm 2045, Trinity's Children's clearly part of the series. I know because Bezos and you told us so. There are currently two books out in this series, but what's next for them? Is Where do you see the story going? So, um, I really am going to try to meet the commitment that I have, which is it was going to be a trilogy. So, my last series, Sentinels, was... Um, supposed to be five books and now it's seven um seven is kind of my upper limit for books because in my experience every author that i ever met whose series went beyond seven ended up getting angry at his characters his fans or both because when he or she tried to move on to a new series the, he they just getting told that they had to write on the fifth the, the older one so uh, i'd never written a trilogy before and i really wanted to to have the discipline to wrap the whole story up into three, um, which is partly why they're so long, um, because there's a lot of story to tell. Uh, so the third book, the first book is, is Trinity's Children, the second book is Humanity's Promise, and the last book is Omandi's Demon. Um, and, um, and that's it. Um, although, uh, I'm talking to my Patreon patrons and on Patreon, and what I'm, the idea I'm kicking around is an homage to Robert Heinlein's wor wor world as myth structure, uh, where um, I may blend some of the characters from Sentinels, well, one, just one character from Sentinels 25 years into the future, 25 years after the events of book seven. Um, and they may join the crew of the, uh, of the Blade Runner for a, an entirely different series that with a working title of paradigm of creation um that kind of explores the concept of the multiverse which was introduced in sentinels uh but not explored at all within um paradigm in fact you don't realize that those are two are the same universes until book six of um sentinels and book two of paradigm and that's when the, the readers realize that those two are connected um, because um, the novella I did for that uh, anthology, Isabella's Campaign, ties it all together between the two, which Seska was sent me a snarky text message about. Who, me? <laughs> yeah, you. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't Doc, know. snarky? No. Never. I know. Never a snark. Let, let a snark come forth from her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so of all the, uh, you've told us a little bit about the tech and what's in this universe, but of all the tech that you created for this series, which one would you want for daily use? Hmm. I guess I would like a singularity gate. Um, the idea of being able to, to move vast distances very quickly uh, is super, super jazzed for me. I love the idea of that. So that would be it. Okay. So Doc's favorite part is to ask you okay. how you would abuse that if you had it for your daily use. She's the reason that's questions there. She's how would I abuse it? Yeah, she's clearly a corrupting influence. Oh, well, gosh, there's singularity and gating into locker rooms. Not that I would do that. You know, you said, but you said abuse. I wouldn't abuse it that way, but being able to pop into places you're not supposed to be, vaults filled with money and gold. Skip the badge line at Dragon Con. Yeah, that would be that would be good. Absolutely. No more traffic. No more traffic. Oh, no more that. traffic. Figures Doc has all the um, all the ideas on how to use and abuse something. It's just, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Doing medical nanites would be totally awesome. No more hangovers. It's true. I didn't think about the nanites. Mm. I've seen now some series where nanites help you lose weight, so that would be good. You can eat all the pizza you want and still not get fat. Yeah. I think maybe Anchi, I may revise it and go Anchi's nanites because they'll heal her and attack people. Ooh. So 
dual purpose, I approve. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. All They're right. Borderline baby murder bots. Yeah. So, so you clearly have aliens because that's the premise of the universe. How do you go about creating them when you do? Do you let nature inspire you, uh, your nightmares, or you just create them completely out of whole cloth? No, I mean, again, I like uh, in in my the, part of the reason why I do near near term science fiction is I like it to be realistic. Uh, I'd like, and, and and some of the best compliments I get in my reviews is, you know, I got one that was just this could happen. That was the review, <laughs> five stars. This could happen. So you don't have to write long reviews to be to, for them to be good. So, um, so the travel is theoretically possible. The ship, the way the ship functions, is theoretically possible. There's a lot of 3D printing. There's all these kinds of things which we can either do now or have all been theoretically um, postulated. Um, so, um, so that that kind of is 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 the basis behind kind of the whole the whole thing. And, and can you can you ask the question again? Because it kind of I started answering and I kind of lost lost my thread. So how do you go about creating the aliens? Oh, the aliens, right, right, right. So, so I like I don't I don't have like a silicon based life form, right? Because I don't I don't get how that would work. And and so so, but I do get the fact that that um, natural selection makes sense, regardless of whether or not you believe in intelligent designer. Or, you know, or you have a, you know, a very specific faith tradition. Um, the concept of, of certain traits make giving you an advantage in those traits being selected makes perfect sense and very few people uh, disagree with it. So I can see a, a species in a different planet, a mammalian species evolving, you know, to, to look more like um, uh, ter- terrestrial um, gorillas. I can see um, a place where cold-blooded uh, reptilians could have selected for uh, intelligence over time. Um, and avian um, and um, insectoid. So there are characters or races in my books that cover all of those things. Uh, I don't have any uh, amorphous blob species uh because i don't get how that would work you know i i i, I uh watched the um the, the brad pitt not brad pitt um the, the chris pratt movie recently um which i liked and there are these like horrifically violent creatures like spinning around the planet and i'm looking at them going those those things couldn't have made a spaceship it's like in signs right the movie that mel was it not mel gibson you know like yeah you need opposable thumbs like I got a basic thing, like you're not building spaceships without opposable thumbs. You're like, well, you could have built robots. How'd you build the robots? You need thumbs or something, right? You need to be able to grasp stuff uh, at a minimum. So, um, so that kind of philosophy governs my aliens is that they, it, got, it has to, it has to pass the, the doesn't make sense test. So how would this species become the dominant species or one of the dominant species on its, on the planet and become spacefaring at FTL capability. So you have to be smart, be able to figure out the math. You have to be dexterous to be able to build things. Uh, you have to be able to mine the raw materials and then convert them into usable products. And you need to be able to do all of that. And you need to be able to communicate. And an, and an amorphous blob creature, you know, that looks like a giant jellyfish, ain't gonna do that, right? They're not gonna have any jellyfish ships. Okay, that works for me. Um, <laughs> although, you know, with hand wavium, all things are possible. But um, yeah, got- and I reserve my hand wavium really for in limited doses. So, so I use the hand wavium in, in where areas that I, I just can't get around any other way. And so, like space travel, because space is so freaking big. So, that's really the only place that I use hand wavium in my books at all is, is how do I get. Um, how do I allow sentient species to travel routinely between worlds within a, a community, a galactic community, when you're separated by thousands of light years? You have to solve that. That's the only one. That's the only thing I use hand waving for in my books. Okay. 
Um, so this is the part where, as we wrap up, I remind you, dear listeners, that uh, please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms because your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So uh, so go out there, and every time you read a book, give a review. I hear every time an author gets 100, he gets a unicorn, but I don't know. That never worked for me. So anyway, um, as this went, uh, interview went long, um, was there anything about Paradigm 2045, Trinity's Children, that we didn't ask you wanted to tell us? No, uh, I think that you covered everything. Great, great questions. I hope people enjoy it. Check it out. And you're absolutely right. Please, please, please do a review. It helps people find the book. And as important, it helps people avoid books they're not going to enjoy. And I have no interest in someone spending their hard-earned money uh, picking up a book of mine that they're not going to enjoy it. I used to be a completionist and every book I started, I would finish. But one thing I learned in Iraq is life is very short. So why waste it? So if I don't like a book, I just don't finish it anymore. So if, uh, if you've got a review that tells you the things about the books, maybe you save a couple bucks. So like yep. I had one review, this was like gun porn written by a 12 year old. I'm like, dude, sign me up. I was infantry for a reason. That was a negative review. Gave it one star. That one star sold the book to me. So. There you go. Even if you yeah. don't like it, you're not necessarily being cruel to say if you if you give a reason, like you know, something yeah. thought out can even help the authors improve. Yeah, but thoughtful reads. Yeah. We don't want uh, we don't want Doc to start snoring on the episode. Nobody wants to see that. So, was there? Uh, can you tell listeners how they can find you? <laughs> yeah, all sorts of places. Um, you can find me at my my uh, publisher site, uh, my my print publishing site, which is spartamac.com s-p-a-r-t-a-m-a-c.com you can get lots of free stuff there some art some unreleased audiobooks and see my progress uh for the next books that i'm writing um uh facebook is at ross author which is all one word instagram is ross underscore author um and uh, my patreon is under my full name robert w ross um, I have lots of tiers uh, at Patreon going all the way down to just a dollar because there's some things that I'm contractually not allowed to talk about outside of a paywall um, that I can talk about behind a paywall. So for a buck, uh, if you want to have some of the behind the scenes stuff and listen to some of Nick's and my bloopers and all those other kinds of things that I'm not allowed to put outside of a paywall, uh, check that out at, at Patreon. It's also the first place I check every, every morning. Uh, so I'm committed to go there first every day. And that's pretty much it. All right. We don't have bloopers. We just have JR. Yeah, we just leave it in. Screw it. We'll do it live. So you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tack and tack blades. Again, that's anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. We're over on the Twitters at SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. You can email the show at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, Blasters and Blades podcast at gmail.com. And to you, Jim, who sent that letter, no, I cannot put a muzzle on Doc. She's kind of scary. So we won't do that. Uh, I, I'm not saying what episode it was, but but it was a little bit spicy. I'll have to see if I delete it or not. I'll forward it to you. She's um, a spicy meatball. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can uh, find us over on Facebook at facebook.com backslash groups backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. Again, backslash groups, backslash Blasters and Blades podcast. You can support the show over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, that's buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to leave a note in the comment section that is for the podcast, and we will keep Doc Saska and Nick Garber duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. Never surrender. Uh, or you can leave Never get up. Never surrender. That's right. That was a great movie, Galaxy Quest. Or you can also support us over on anchor.fm backslash blasters, tack and tack blades. And now, before she falls asleep and starts drooling on herself, Doc, can you bring it home? I do not drool. Huh. I've seen you. But that's you usually because some, some hot guy at the con walks in front of you. Okay, that's a different story. Okay. Same. Seeing the drool. Yeah, Seeing it happen. Okay. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber, the addled brain J.R. Handley. You deserve that, J.R. I'm Seska. This was the Blasters and Blaze podcast. We'll be back next week. Same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, everything that goes boom, pineapple on pizza. And no. of course, yes, pineapple. Pineapple goes great. Avocado on pizza? Yes. 
Okay, never we can do avocado it. ones. What chair? I've never tried it. That sounds heathenistic. Well, time for you to try some new horizons, dude. All right. On that heretical note, I'm going to end the broadcast before the uh, FAA or whoever monitors nonsense throws us in jail for such criminal behavior as avocados on pizza. <laughs>